Well, hello again, everybody. I'm sorry that you missed your field day. It would have been a lot of fun to be out in the vineyard because that's... <clears throat> I, I always enjoyed my field trips as a student because you're doing multi-tactile learning. Not only are you hearing, and, but you're also seeing and touching, smelling, all those other good things. So those, I really value those experiences. So unfortunately, you're stuck with me in the dark room late in the day. So again, we'll try to keep it moving along. When I was hired in 1987, to the University of California, it said specifically in my job description that I would work with sustainable agriculture, that I would work with organic farmers. And that sort of made sense being in Mendocino County because we've always been kind of a little hotbed of, uh, of alternative farming practices. So we not only have sustainable, but we also have organic and biodynamic growers. And the uh, thing that's, that is starting to emerge from all this is kind of the concept of regenerative agricultural systems where essentially we're trying to promote soil and plant health by using photosynthesis for the removal and retention of atmospheric carbon dioxide into stable soil carbon. And uh, there's numerous benefits, uh, and this is taking a different look at really what we're doing as, a, as growers. We, we have enough trouble already with just trying to grow really high quality fruit, but now we also have to save the planet too. And why do we have to save the planet? Because we've got some bad stuff going on, and primarily it's because anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide are changing our climate. 98% uh, of climate scientists support that, according to my very good friend, Dr. Greg Jones from uh, Linville College up in, in Oregon, who has done a lot of work on this in, as it pertains to viticulture. And the other 2% who don't believe are mostly funded by oil companies. So um, that's kind of the way that it is from my perspective. It's pretty much an accepted fact. And if you look at the graph on the, uh, the upper right-hand corner, it shows what's been going on with carbon dioxide accumulation, very high, highly correlated with the, uh, the advent of fossil fuels. And you know, I, I, I feel a little hypocritical showing up in our F-250 uh, pickup truck from work today. I don't know how many tons of carbon I produced on the way down here, but um, carbon dioxide. But it, you know, we, we have to start accepting the fact that it's probably time for a change in a lot of ways that we think about how we do business. And I guess this is one of the things that's the big question of the century, which I'm going to leave to the next generation of of scientists and and growers is. Climate change inevitable, or can it be mitigated? Are there things we can do that actually can change how things uh, will will turn out in the future? So one of the things we're having to do, and especially in California, where we have kind of value proposition about what I call public trust resources, these are things that you're responsible for on your property, but you don't own. So it's things like air and the water and uh, wildlife, you, you have kind of a responsibility and you're going to be held responsible if you don't take care of those resources carefully. Uh, so what, what we're, we're saying is that essentially we have to protect our soil and waterways, um, storing water, and these are things that we can actually do on our farm. The whole idea of ecological services that your farm becomes an asset not only to you but also to the community for, for taking care of, of the environment. So we can certainly see that it could be home for beneficial insects and pollinators, habitat for diverse species, sequestering carbon. And uh, if we look at sustainable biodynamic and organic farming practices, they're, they're already kind of OK with that. I mean, they've accepted that as part of their, their value system. Uh, and it's written into the goals of a lot of the uh, certification programs. So the concept of soil health is in that difficult. In the past, we always talked about soil quality. Was what is good for uh, a grapevine to grow? What does it need? The, the fertility, the water, the, the physical attributes of the soil. But now we're going to add to it a little bit. Um, we're also going to say uh, carbon sequestration is an important part of soil health. And that's going to be one of our goals is to try to acquire carbon. Uh, we would like to have soil, active soil microbes. We really would like to have high water infiltration rates and retention, especially for the kind of things we're going through right now, an atmospheric river. It's really great. The more water we can store in the soil, uh, the better we're going to be. 
And protection of the soil against erosion is also very, very critical. Again, going back to public trust resources, so water flows through your property. You're not allowed to dump a bunch of dirt into it and let it go into a river. And if you do that, you're going to pay a price, uh, not only scorn from your neighbors, but they'll probably the Regional Water Quality Control Board is going to show up and start writing you tickets. That's already happened. So uh, the precedent is certainly there. So this isn't real complicated. Uh, what we have to do to go in the right direction, whenever possible, let's keep the soil covered. Now, every site's going to be different, so I can't say you should cover crop and no-till every single place. Uh, that may not be the case. So it still comes down to you as a manager as to what's right for your system. But when we can, let's keep the soil covered, because if we're going to make carbon in the soil, if we're going to uh, take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and get it down into the soil, it's going to happen faster if we can keep the soil covered. We'd really like to minimize tillage and soil disturbance, if at all possible. Because again, we know that soil carbon accumulates fastest under uh, cover. When we expose soil to sunlight, uh, essentially we have a breakdown uh, and evaporation, uh, oxidation of that car carbonaceous material uh, goes right back into the atmosphere. It's a really good idea if we can have di diverse plant species to increase biotic diversity below ground. Okay, this is making your system more complex because now you're farming several crops instead of just one. You're not doing just grapevines. You're doing other things. But we'll address that, and we'll try to make it as simple as possible for you, but we'll also target maybe specifically what you need for your soil. And whenever possible, let's keep living roots uh, in the soil throughout the year. Um, that's not easy if you're, you're in a place like the Deep Valley, you know, if you're down around Bakersfield, that's going to be pretty hard. But it, it can be pretty easy if you're in coastal California, like the deep end of uh, Anderson Valley. But the point is, is when we can, let's, let's try to have activity going on in the soil uh, with living roots. We're, we're having to look at probably some different ways to farm than we have in the past, and we certainly are seeing new equipment. Uh, that what we're seeing in the upper left-hand corner was something that we saw in Chile that I really liked. It was a soil cultivator that really changes the way that soil is, is worked. Instead of inverting it like a disc does, it just sort of pops it up and loosens it. And then uh, there's a, a little device. Let's see if I can find the pointer. Oh, anyway, uh, if, if you look on the, there's kind of like a, a wing-shaped uh, cutter there that goes underneath the vines and cuts the soil. So it's kind of a, a poor man's Clemens. Instead of being a really complicated hydraulic multi-thousand dollar machine, it's just something that was tacked on by the, the mechanics in the shed and they did a great job. And it really doesn't, pretty efficient uh, in and out underneath the vine. Um, it trips itself automatically and it, it cuts out a lot of weeds and kind of helps cultivate when you do need to cultivate. The other thing we're starting to do is think about developing carbon farm plans, which some of the resource conservation districts are doing now in uh, the North Coast, and uh, trying to figure out how to sequester more carbon on your property and actually help you design a system that will do that for you. So certainly for organic and biodynamic agriculture, uh, you have to add organic matter, something they expect you to do. And our, our principal ways of doing it are with uh, compost and cover crops and also conservation tillage. So there's techniques we can use to retain organic matter in the soil uh, and move away from having that nice clean look that we, that some people still love to have around their wineries, but it's probably not the best thing for your soil. Composting is something that I'm a real uh, big advocate of because essentially we have solid waste coming out of wineries. And in the olden days, they used to dump it uh, in landfills, which is crazy because, I mean, it has a very high nutrient content. And uh, more important than that, it, it can be a really important source of nitrogen. <coughs> what I think is interesting, if we look at what it takes to make a kilogram of, of nitrogen, uh, it's about 78 million joules of energy. Uh, that's enough water to heat 9,350 gallons by one degree, whereas if we... Uh, get the nitrogen from compost, it's way less. It's 527,000 joules, or about enough heat 
to uh, uh, lift 136 gallons of water one degree. So it's a fraction, okay? So we're letting nature take over. And that's a really good way to maintain our soil fertility. We're fortunate with wine grapes. We don't really need a lot of soil fertility compared to other crops. So uh, we don't have high levels of, of nitrogen additions compared to growing corn or vegetables. There's a lot of different stages of soil organic matter uh, going on. So uh, the blue piece of the pie there is biomass. That's stuff that uh, is alive, primarily roots in the soil. Uh, the brown part are residues from crops and, and roots that have been sloughed. And then a yellow, a yellow part would be humus. And that's the more or less stable what's left over that coats the soil particles and gives us that nice black color. So this is kind of an ideal situation. So we see that the living part of the soil is relatively small uh, in some respects. And by mass, it's really the long-term humus that we're trying to create uh, in healthy soils. Now, why would you want to bother? Here's another reason why. Because one pound of organic matter can hold up to 40 pounds of water or five gallons. So if, again, if we're trying to create vineyards that are somewhat resilient to drought and such, uh, building organic matter makes a lot of sense. So if we can get 1% increase in uh, soil organic matter, which we can in most of our medium textured soils without too much trouble, we're adding another 21,000 gallons of water per acre. And on the North Coast, that's significant. That's a lot of water for us and uh, really helps us with uh, reduce the amount of water we need to irrigate. So uh, we have the potential to increase water storage by one third in most uh, moderate textured soils. So in kind of loams and such, we can really increase our water holding capacity tremendously by increasing organic matter. And more importantly, if we have plant cover, we're going to increase our infiltration rates by 200%. And this has been shown time and time again. When you have a well-structured soil with cover, uh, it takes water really well. So when we get into events like we've been experiencing in the last two, two uh, days, you're going to store more water, uh, and the water is going to be purified and go through the whole uh, water cycle much better uh, when we have uh, soils that have living mulch or even crop residues on the surface. This is kind of fun, just taking a look. If we look at all the organic matter, if we weigh it uh, in terms of kilograms per hectare, we'd have about 120,000 kilograms uh, in the, the typical humid climate grassland. About 105,000 pounds would be non-living organic matter. And almost 5,000, I'm sorry, not pounds, that was kilos. Uh, almost 5,000 kilos of, of microbes. So they, they vastly outnumber all the other things that are in there. Uh, so the microbial activity in your soil goes way up when we have high levels of organic matter, and there's lots of it. And they have a lot of ecological function for cycling nutrients and uh, cleaning water. Here are some of the benefits. So we see the decomposition of plant residues uh, nitrogen cycling is fertilizer and organic matter as things are decomposed. The increased availability of a lot of our plant nutrients, humus formation and carbon cycling, aggregate formation, which basically is structure in the soil, suppression of pathogens and mycorrhizal relationships. So these are all things the microbes are doing for you. So when we uh, immediately put cover crops into the soil, the plant tissue is going to be our primary uh, source of soil organic matter. Uh, soil life is stimulated. The cover crops serve as a food source for vertebrates, invertebrates, and microbes. And soil respiration rates and microbe numbers increase very dramatically. So the microbes are all there. They, it's not like we have to bring them in. They're just all kind of hunkering down and waiting for the party to start. And when we plant cover crops, that starts the party um, because they, they need a food source. It's fairly simple but very effective. Soil protection with cover crops, basically the cover crops keep the uh, soil from, uh, from being broken down, the soil aggregates and sealing. And the, when we have cover, we're going to have higher infiltration rates and we're not going to have the soil sealing. Water is not going to run laterally and erode. So this is one of the main reasons why we want to have cover crops in place. Different functions. Uh, 
this is a little bit out of order. I should have done this one first. The cover crop, crop types, I, I kind of break them into really four categories. So the, the grasses and the legumes are kind of the ones I think most of you are familiar with. I also kind of talk specifically about soil carbon builders. These are cover crops that will build a lot of biomass, don't have necessarily particularly useful roots for helping to protect the soil, uh, but they they do accumulate a lot of organic matter, and a lot of times they scavenge nitrogen too and prevent it from leaching. So um, these are things like mustards and other kinds of forbs. Uh, then we also have insectary uh, disease suppression type cover crops. I'm going to jump back here again and just take a look at those grass roots. Grass roots are very, very important in holding soil in place. So the picture you see on the left uh, shows two chunks of soil taken from the same place. The one on the right uh, has not been hosed down. The one on the left has received a full pressure hose that took about five minutes to wash the soil out of there. So that's one of the primary uh, functions of grass roots is that they have lots of little fine roots. They exude a lot of waxes and uh, they are a nice home for microbes to form uh, other kind of polysaccharides and things that glue the soil particles together. So they're very, very important if you're trying to protect your soil from erosion. They're also adding a, a lot of organic matter too, particularly if you go into sod culture. So we figure that uh, about half of the root system is sloughed off during the year, plus everything that grows above ground. So a lot of grasses are very, very important if you really want to grow organic matter and you're in a situation where you can do that. Unfortunately, that situation tends to be Oregon, not California. Uh, it's really a little dry here, and it's hard for us to do perennial grass systems. Okay, we're going to skip this. We've got a lot of different kinds of legumes. Um, there's all sorts of, of different uh, peas and vetches and clovers, uh, then some other unusual things that, that we've looked at before that have made effective cover crops um, that are, aren't commonly used here, like lupins and... Um, Ryan, what was the other one that we grew that was lentil, lentil pe peas were fantastic and uh, the, anyway, the legumes are important to us because they have a wonderful symbiotic relationship with um, rhizobia bacteria and here you can see some micrograph down in the lower right hand corner of rhizobia and when you cut into the nodules that's where the nitrogen fixing is taking place. Essentially, atmospheric nitrogen comes in, gets converted into a, a proteins that are usable by plants as they uh, decompose. And uh, it gives it that kind of reddish color. And it's because of the bacterium that does the fixing, rhizobium. What can we expect if we're going to actually grow these things? Well, uh, vetches can fix anywhere from 50 to 200 pounds per planted acre. Uh, medics are around 50 to 100, and it kind of goes down a little bit for subclovers. In a vineyard system, I'd be looking at the low numbers, so uh, rather than the high numbers. But if you really want to get carried away, you can make a lot of nitrogen. You look at something like Bursine clover as the champion; it can make 300 pounds per acre, and that is a lot of nitrogen. It's way more than you would need in in most uh, vineyard systems, I would think, since 30 pounds is what. Uh, is considered to be an adequate amount in a lot of vineyard systems. So we can certainly grow enough nitrogen in places that's what we want to do. But again, you're growing two crops, so you have to think about if I'm going to grow really good cover crops, I've got to kind of provide for them. So in the case of legumes, they're going to need phosphorus and sulfur to really be effective. Usually sulfur is not a big issue because we use sulfur as a fungicide, but phosphorus may be. So you have a couple of options there. Uh, in general, if you're using compost at the rate of one or two tons per acre per year, that's adequate for your cover crop and you wouldn't need any more. Here are some examples of the soil carbon builders, uh, different kinds of radishes, um, rutabagas and mustards. They're kind of fun because they're pretty easy to grow. Their seeds tend to be cheap, especially mustard. There's a lot of different kinds of mustards and they can be as little as $5 a pound per acre for seed. And they can make up to 10,000 pounds of biomass in a good year. So they're really stars. And then in addition to that, they probably can have some very negative effects on some of the uh, plant parasitic nematodes and things in your vineyard. So there is some, some benefits from that. They're, they're not going to work as good as 
putting on a soil fumigant, but they can definitely help you suppress some of the nematode populations, and it's been shown to be effective. There are some, some selections of mustard that are specifically good at doing that, and uh, they have uh, thiocyanates in, the, in their roots, and as they decompose, they can be toxic to other soil organisms. Uh, <clears throat> there you can see some, some forage turnips. Uh, they look like turnips, and they used to be used actually quite a bit in the North Coast for feeding livestock. They used to have free-range, or, or at least uh, outdoor pigs that would go and eat those, and cows as well. And they, they grow a lot of biomass. It's very easy to get close to uh, 40 or 50 tons of these things per acre. So um, it's not commonly used, but I don't know if you really want to impress somebody and grow a lot of organic matter. That's one way to do it. We also have insectary cover crops and plantings, and I just want to caution a little about this because some people figure, well, if you plant the right kind of cover crop, you'll in have a really effective biocontrol and you won't have to spray. And the more we look at this, the, the less enthusiastic we are about using cover crops as a way of, of uh, getting beneficials in to actually control some of our problematic insects like leafhoppers. They probably help some, but they're not as good as they sound. Um, I think it's useful to have biodiversity in your vineyard for uh, habitat for other kinds of insects. And there's certainly no doubt when I walk into organic and biodynamic vineyards, they are loaded with uh, uh, all kinds of generalist predators and parasitoids. But we've never really been able to say, if you plant these cover crops, you won't have to spray for leafhoppers. That's never, we've never been able to say that. Certainly we can say uh, in the case of uh, predaceous mites that if you plant some of these cover crops, the predaceous mites are going to stick around. I have seen that. That's true. Uh, that being said, I still recommend if you're going to use predaceous mites for controlling spider mites, you ought to do a yearly augmentation. Uh, but they definitely move back and forth between the ground and, and the cover crops. So there are some benefits uh, compared to having just bare soil. When we started looking close, we kind of skirted around this a little bit yesterday, was the microbiome. And those are the organisms in a particular environment or the combined genetic material of the organisms in a particular environment. And I think that's kind of the key point about microbes is that there's genetic resources there that are used by other organisms. It's very complex uh, biology we're just beginning to understand because the genetics of the microbes really impact the organism that they're on or in. And that includes us. We're starting to understand that some of our autoimmune diseases are related to the microbiomes in our guts. And there's even such things as poop transplants to try to get you balanced if you're not. It's a really fascinating study of, of, of science that we we're just now getting onto. And I think the, because genomics are getting so much better, our ability to characterize what kind of genetic material is present is going to really make major breakthroughs for us in the years to come. Uh, this is a quote from somebody, I should have attributed it properly, but uh, understanding the microbiome, human, animal, and environmental is as important as the uh, human genome. On grapevines, we have uh, several different microbiome areas. One is the philosphere, the leaf surfaces, which I've done some work again with our ice nucleating bacteria is a good example of how we're trying to manipulate that area. Also using uh, other kinds of uh, bioinsecticides and, and uh, fungicides will affect the microbiomes. The fructosphere is what's around fruit, and of course that's becoming the, for a lot of winemakers, very interesting to them because they would like to have spontaneous fermentations. They would lo love it if they could just crush the fruit and then uh, let nature take over from there and, and have a good experience. And most of the time it happens, but sometimes things run a mess. I think you have to keep track of that, but a lot of winemakers now are doing that, and especially biodynamic winemakers, they're kind of required to do that. They're not supposed to add any yeast to their fermentations. And it turns out that that's probably a, a, a good part of what terroir might be, is that association of the microbiome from fruit and soil with the wine itself. And there, there are studies going on at UC Davis that suggest that there's a pretty important relationship between the microbial biomes and, and uh, their perceived quality of wine. So the traditional methods of trying to isolate these things out and pure culture is going to be really greatly assisted by genomics. 
And I think this is a science that uh, is really going to help us with our farming systems ecology and the uh, understanding of those. Here's just a quick look, and we don't have time to go through this, but there's a whole bunch of different organisms that are associated with different parts of the plant. Uh, the leaves have a totally different kind of microbial makeup than what's on the fruit. And of course, the roots have something else totally different again. So uh, there's a lot going on here that, that uh, affects plant health. And trying to manipulate and work with those microbiomes, I think, is the future. I, I think that's something that scientists are going to begin to understand. There's such a, a bunch of activity going on now. You're going to be hearing more about this, I know. So the currency of microbiome is exudates, is what's coming off of, these, uh, of the plant. So the plants can communicate with microorganisms to alleviate stresses such as pathogen attacks, drought limiting, nutrient acquisition, and metal toxicity, to name a few. These have all been shown with other plants, not necessarily with wine grapes. So the micro uh, microbes benefit from the plant exudates by using them as a resource, in many cases carbohydrates, but also other nutrients. So it's kind of a, a mutually beneficial relationship here. And the microbes can actually help the plants um, by signaling them in what we call quorum sensing. So there's, uh, there's a definite interaction in an ecological relationship. Generally speaking about the philosphere of the grapevines is that they don't have uh, large numbers of, or diverse species of microbes. Uh, and I talked about this already. And bacteria that we find on the foliage of, of wine grapes are probably coming from adjacent uh, plants, primarily off the, the vineyard floor and then also neighboring trees. Neighboring trees are also a source of a lot of the yeasts that end up on the fruit. So if you live in an area that has a lot of forest around it, you probably have a pretty high and diverse population of, of different kinds of, of yeast living on your vines. The other thing you need to understand is the yeasts that, that are on the fruit are not necessarily in really large numbers because it doesn't take a large number of, of yeast cells to get going because they can multiply so rapidly that you probably have some pretty low density, but as soon as you crush the fruit and let it sit for a couple days, then their numbers build up exponentially and fast. <coughs> Here's kind of a micrograph of what it looks like on leaf surface. So on the the left-hand side, you can see that's one that's coated with a lot of different kinds of yeast and my, uh, bacteria. On the right is a, a stomate with just a few little uh, cells adjacent to it. And uh, that's kind of an example of what, what's going on in terms of density. So I would say the one on the left has a lot of microbes and the one on the right doesn't. So looking at the fruit, we can see that uh, there's lots of different kinds of microbes, Saccharomyces and uh, Lactobacillus and a bunch of others. There's, there's other kinds of yeast that can affect wine flavor, but once you crush fruit, Saccharomyces pretty much gets in the driver's seat very quickly and knocks off everything else. And then uh, after time, the <coughs> alcohol knocks off the Saccharomyces and the, you know, there, there may be other things left, but not a lot. When we get down into the rhizosphere, that's really where the most activity and the highest density of microbes is in this farming system. Uh, there's a lot of biodiversity and there's some important groups to, to making the soil function well. The first group are the actinomycetes. The actinomycetes are very, very involved in helping to structure soil. That's one of the things that they do. Um, they give that soil that nice earthy flavor when you, uh, or smell shouldn't say flavor unless you eat dirt. <laughs> there are some people who do. It's kind of odd. But um, certainly when you, when you dig into a compost pile that's been well weathered or you dig into soil and has that nice smell that you like, that's what you're smelling is primarily actinomycetes. Um, they, they're involved in, in decomposition of uh, initially of some of the organic matter. The fungi are also another very, very big group that uh, have kind of three fun functions. One are decomposers. Uh, the second are mutualists. So they live with the plants and they help the plants acquire nutrients and water in some cases. And then there's also a group of pathogens. So if we have a really uh, vibrant system, the pathogens have a tough time sticking around uh, because they become food. 
when you have a simple system where there's nothing in there except for you know, low organic matter and not a lot of, of biodiversity in, in the vineyard system, that's when the pathogens become stronger. And uh, you can make a big difference in plant health. A lot of the organic vineyards in Mendocino County on AXR lasted a long, long time, even though it was diagnosed with AXR, because what was going on is that the, uh, the problems that we were having with phylloxera was it wasn't so much due directly to the phylloxera or secondary in, uh, infections that were coming in from Fusarium and Rhizoctonia. And when we increased levels of organic matter, uh, those pathogens weren't nearly as important because they weren't really red hot pathogens, but they became food for the other microbes. And under high organic matter conditions, uh, the pathogenesis of those uh, two pathogens went way down. And we were able to, to keep the vineyards going for up to 20 years at, at commercially viable levels. They still needed to be replanted. They eventually gave out. But that was a pretty effective way of, of managing phylloxera. The fungal decomposers can live in drier conditions and lower pH than bacteria. So uh, bacteria are also really important uh, components of, of the uh, microbiome in the soil. But uh, fungi do a lot of work for us in terms of breaking stuff down. So they decompose cellulose and lignin, which are kind of resistant, really, in many respects to, uh, to being degraded. So uh, our fungal decomposers is very important in those. And unlike bacteria, the, the fungi form hyphae that uh, penetrate substrates. And those waxes and things then are, are really important to uh, holding the soil together. Now, I don't want to uh, diss the bacteria. The bacteria are doing a lot of really good things for us. So they, they're for, forming these uh, uh, kind of microbial biofilms. And when it comes to cleaning water through soil, so when we have contaminated water that it hits soil, Soil will digest a lot of stuff trying to go through it, and it's, a, and it's the bacterial uh, biofilms that are doing that function. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of slow sand filters before. Uh, slow sand filters are used for, for taking pretty microbially polluted water. They're used commonly for um, uh, third world countries where they don't really have a lot of, of uh, good technology for, for cleaning water. And by trickling them through uh, a column of sand where the bacteria grow well, they actually purify the water. So by the time you get out the bottom of this tank with sand in it, uh, there's no, essentially the water is very, very safe to drink. And we're also seeing uh, what we call trickle towers in Mendocino County. We have them used as kind of a, a, a bioremediation for wastewater coming out of wineries. And they, they basically, Fairly simple setup, what you do is you take a, and make a, construct a tower out of like old barrel racks with uh, wood staves in them and you trickle water uniformly over it and let it come down and you get the bile uh, films forming and they clean up the water very, very nicely. They'll take a lot of nutrients and other things out of it. So uh, it, it's an, a, a nice alternative to using a bunch of chemicals. So uh, the Mendocino Wine Company, or also Parducci Winery as it's known, uh, has a system that takes 2,000 water with 2,000 biological oxygen demand units, gets it down to under 10, and uses a quarter of the energy of a conventional kind of water uh, treatment system. Pretty interesting. The fungal mutualists uh, are the endophytic fungi that actually live in the root systems of grapevines, and they impart um, resistance to diseases. They help with, with uh, nutrient acquisition and are very, very important for grapevine health. Back in the days when we used to use a methyl bromide, a lot of times we'd plant vineyards and they wouldn't grow very well afterwards. And we found if we actually inoculated the, uh, the plants with kind of a mixture of different endophytes, um, they would start to grow again. Uh, so Methyl bromide killed everything off, so we have to re-inoculate the plants and put them in the ground, and and uh, uh, that helped the essentially the grapevines do things like absorb phosphorus. Phosphorus has a very important relationship to endophytic fungi and 
the, uh, the grapevine, and that's probably how grapes are getting most of their phosphorus. Well, just kind of a picture of the same thing. Um, so to kind of wrap this up, what about soil health assessments? We've talked a lot, and is this just more fluff, or do we have some real stuff here? And the answer is no, we have some real stuff, and Cornell University has been working on this for quite a while. They have developed soil health tests that involve both physical, biological, and chemical composition uh, of the soils. So the kinds of things that they're looking at, texture, bulk density, and aggregate stability, these are all things we've known about for years, but you actually, we don't typically test these in labs, but as part of the soil health uh, assessment that Cornell is using. They've been at it now for a long time, so they, they uh, have a really great system where Essentially, you send your soil uh, in for testing, and they'll give you where you stand in terms of the percentiles, because they, they feel that they have enough soil tests in the Northeast. They can talk about of these qualities being normally distributed inside of their samples. So they can say, well, the uh, aggregate stability of your soil is about uh, in the 90th percentile you know, for, for that particular type of soil. So uh, they're way ahead of the West Coast on this. The kind of things that we chemically test for for soil health, uh, pH, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, and cation exchange capacity are things that are very important to us as a, a vineyardist. Biological testing, uh, we look at total organic carbon. We look at active carbon, and the active carbon is the, uh, uh, the uh, carbon that actually is likely to uh, degrade and change. Uh, total organic nitrogen and potentially mineralizable uh, nitrogen. So these are all different things that tell us how active is the nitrogen pool that's in your soil, how available is it for, for digestion by microbes. Well, where are we going with all this and, and why should we care? Well, it's a personal effort uh, of, that you can do on yourself to address climate change and build resiliency into your vineyard. And as we go forward and looking at climate change, I think building resiliency is a really important part of what you want to do. You want to be able to take that one or two heat storms without everything falling apart on you. And we've talked a lot about that, the talk before about trying to protect your fruit from uh, being visited by the raisin fairy, as I call it, you know, where you're just direct. I see this all the time at Pinot Noir. Grape growers say they're just, it's Friday, they're ready to pick, but it's not quite right, so we'll wait till Monday. And Saturday and Sunday, it's 110 degrees, and by Monday, they've lost a third of their crop on the, on the sunny side of the vines. It's turned to raisin. So, you know, this is what we, we want to avoid. We want to find ways to, to make our, our vineyards tough, you know, to be able to, to take a little heat stress without falling apart, without going into some sort of collapse because it got a little bit hotter than we expected. Uh, so, so that's one of the things that I, I think is going to be important. The CDFA has started the Healthy Soils Incentive Program, and they're going to start paying uh, to make some uh, improvements in your vineyard. And I've got some paperwork on that. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But there may be a time too where you also pay. For, they'll pay for carbon credits uh, as carbon offset. Uh, if, if you're actually able to demonstrate that you're building carbon in your soil. I'll be honest with you, if you really want to fix carbon, don't do it in the soil in your vineyard, do it with trees or on the edge of your vineyard. So uh, that's something that's pretty easy here on the North Coast because almost everybody's got a creek or a river nearby and there's places where you can't farm anyway. So uh, planting trees and letting them s uh, sop up the carbon is a really, really good way. They're way more effective in soil for short-term pickup of uh, of fixing carbon. I suspect there'll be new sections for the Code of Sustainability, SIP, Lodi Rules, et cetera, on soil health and soil health assessments since it's starting to emerge. And uh, we're, we're working pretty closely with uh, Oregon State and Oregon Live in trying to develop uh, soil health assessments. Here in, in the North Coast, we have a group of, of us working uh, in the form of uh, the, the Resource Conservation Districts, NRCS, and Cooperative Extension on uh, soil health. And you can look it up. We have a website where we talk about some of the different uh, practices and assessments that we're doing. And we've uh, got funding 
from CDFA and now also from the USDA to keep doing our, our studies. And essentially what we're trying to do is develop what Cornell has done, which is a, a database of, of soil health indicators. And we invite you to participate. There's stuff happening all over the North Coast on that. And I would suggest kind of taking a look at Cornell's uh, soil health assessment site too. They have a really great handbook that you can download that has a lot of information about soil health and uh, I think it really, you'd find it useful if you, if you kind of like this sort of information. Then to kind of wrap it up, uh, the CDFA Climate Smart grants that are happening, uh, there's several different programs. The two that uh, I'm most familiar with is the State Water Efficiency and Enhancement Program. You can get up to $100,000 to make uh, improvements on weather monitoring, uh, irrigation, uh, system delivery, including solar arrays for your pumps and variable speed uh, drives for your pumps. So uh, Mark talked about it a little bit, and I just want to reinforce that if you're, if you're interested, you should apply for the money. There, it's kind of a short turnaround for the first set of grants. It's going to be March 8th, but odds are they're going to be uh, having another uh, call for proposals. And uh, a lot of different organizations are helping fill these out here on the North Coast, Fish Friendly Farming, some of the RCDs, and then also UC Cooperative Extension in our office where we'll give you some assistance in putting together those grants. The Healthy Soils Program is uh, incentives to try to build soil carbon. Uh, they'll help pay for compost and uh, cover crop seed up to $75,000 for that. So there's another, you know, that's, that's a lot of money for your, your ranch if you qualify for the program. And most of you don't have a dairy farm, so don't worry about the alternative manure management program. That's really not for you. So uh, there's two people inside of UC who, uh, in the North Coast, working on this. Britta Baskerville, who is my community education specialist, uh, is helping out with SWEEP and the Healthy Soil Program grants. And I've got some handouts in her card up here if you want to get a hold of that. And then, uh, again, we have Randy Black there, but she's with dairies. Unless some of you are dairy farmers and grape growers. I know they exist. <laughs> and that's about all I have for you. And I, I thank you for being so patient. You know, we were asking a lot of you to sit here in a, in a darkened room with PowerPoint slides and looking at all this stuff that really makes us excited as scientists, you know, like all the this regression analysis and, and data points and things that, as farmers, we hope you get the end product and we're, we're, we're really excited about this. This is why we share this with you because it, it's, it's our lives. But uh, I also appreciate what you do because I'm a grape grower as well, so I know how tough it is to get up in the morning and uh, you know, go out and get the tractor started and be there with the pickers when it's time to harvest the fruit. And, and there's a lot of pride that comes from that. And I know that you take your work really seriously, too. And it's really been a lot of fun to be with you for the last two days. And thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? From the back. Oh, compost tea, yeah. Um, I, I don't, I'm not a compost tea fan myself. I mean, why fool around with trying to strain it and spray it when you can just throw it on the vineyard floor and be done with it? And I, I think you're going to get as much good out of it that way. Uh, the, leaves are not really great ways to um, absorb nutrients, even though we do a lot of foliars, and they can be effective for some things. But uh, I don't think in terms of changing the microbiome of, of the leaf or anything, you're going to get a lot of advantage out of it. And I've not seen anything in my 30 years of working with you know, organic and biodynamic growers that suggest that there's uh, a lot of good comes out of that for all the trouble you go through. Yes?
hold on. Yeah, the two really good questions. The first one being on uh, can you overdo it with the uh, compost and, and cover crops? And the answer is heck yeah. I mean, you can see that if, if you're able to grow 300 pounds per acre of nitrogen with some of the cover crops, you probably don't want to do that. Um, and, and it is something that you can adjust, though, and, and probably same thing with compost. You know, we've kind of turned our nose up a little bit at, at urban compost that's made from green waste. That actually might be really good for vineyards because it tends to be a little bit neutral. So if you're in a situation where you have bigger, that's probably the compost you want. You don't want to get one of these uh, uh, low uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio type composts, which are really good to stimulate plant growth. Uh, we probably want a higher one. So instead of having one that's 20 to 1, you might one, want one that's 40 to 1. Uh, same thing with cover crops, you probably want to choose a, like those car carbonaceous carbon accumulators rather than putting a bunch of legumes into the system and stimulating more nitrogen. So this is all about very site specific about what you do to make things work right for you. Fish friendly farming has talked a lot about uh, other greenhouse gases that you can inadvertently add to the system, which is really a good point. And there's, there's two gases we're really concerned about that are way more potent uh, than carbon dioxide and a greenhouse effect, uh, one of them being methane. And methane tends to show up when we uh, incorporate a lot of organic matter into the soil during really wet periods where it's likely to get saturated. And the other thing that we have happen at the same time is denitrification where uh, nitrates are converted into nitrous oxide, both of them very, very potent greenhouse gases. Now, there is a natural flux of these gases that takes place in any uh, plant ecosystem. So it's not like you're never going to have them. It's just you don't want to promote them. So that's why uh, if you're thinking about doing a nitrogen application late in the season, um, rethink that a little bit because if the leaves are falling off the plant I don't think you're going to get a lot of nitrogen uptake at that point but what you will get is a lot of denitrification so that fertilizer goes in the soil it's wet uh, so some of it gets denitrified goes up in the atmosphere some leaches down in the water table so timing your nitrogen fertilizer is a really important part of avoiding that um, and, the, and the same thing with when we incorporate large amounts of organic matter uh, when it's going to be wet, that's when we're going to make methane, so you don't want to do that either. So these are things we don't really have the answer for yet, but we know that they're involved in there, and we know they're part of this natural system. So uh, that's why, for instance, we're cover cropping in the Mendocino region, mostly we just sprinkle it on the surface. We don't even bother incorporating it because we find that in general we're not using huge amounts. We're normally putting on about a ton per acre but a lot of the uh, soil fauna will come up and eat it and bring it back down into the soil and it'll be pretty much gone by springtime. Good question. All right. Oh, one more. So, uh, if I'm just going to convert a vineyard from no to no-till, uh, what's that vineyard going to look like and how am I going to get there other than just can't just stop tilling and try that so so there's kind of two approaches the question is about uh, you know what happens if I just stop tilling and I don't like the looks because what I get is a bunch of uh, nasty weeds and I don't want a bunch of nasty weeds so that's where the cover cropping comes in and, and some of our cover crops are pretty good at choking out other kinds of weeds and making it difficult for them to grow. Uh, so, so for instance, self-receding annual legumes and, and grasses are kind of my default position to go to, so I recommend zero fescue, blando brome, subterranean clover, uh, burr clover, uh, rose clover. Th these are things that are Mediterranean plants that uh, bloom, set seed. A lot of them have kind of a short winter dormancy, so they finish up even before you're, you're starting to uh, have bud break. And you just mow them and you're good. And they compete pretty favorably with some of the weeds you don't want. You're not going to have perfect conditions. I mean, if, if you're used to this really nice, beautiful, whipped up and fluffed soil in your vineyard, um, it really does look nice, but it's not good for the soil. So there, there has to be kind of an adjustment. It's kind of like, Again, this is a very Mendocino thing. The guys up there don't shave their faces a lot. 
and the gals don't necessarily shave their legs. And, you know, we're not used to that uh, in other parts of California. So when you come into our region, it's different, all right? So that's kind of our vineyards sort of are the same. Uh, if you're used to the nice tidiness of, that you see sometimes around Napa wineries, it's not like that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, we're, we're being, um, how do I put this politely? Uh, our, our, our aesthetics are definitely different. So that's what you've got to get a little bit used to. And it doesn't preclude you from not doing tillage. It's just that uh, you probably want to change some of your tillage implements. Uh, you, you probably don't want to be going in there with a heavy disc that, like I said, where you whip and fluff the soil. But rather you want to switch maybe to some of these cultivators that push the, the soil up and cut the weeds and then have a roller behind it that packs it back down again. So uh, it still looks pretty neat, but it's, you're not inverting the soil. When you invert the soil, it's like having a cataclysmic cataclysmic earthquake and tsunami all at the same time for the soil microbes. Thanks. Thank you.